Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of The Longing. I'm actually recording this one quite early in the afternoon. It's currently 2 p.m. Just because I'm actually busy this evening for a change. So, um, recording it slightly earlier. But anyway, we are, we are going to be continuing to read Dream Days. So let's get going. In itself, the picture, which in its ebony and tortoise shell frame, hung in a corner of the dining room, and hitherto possessed no special interest for us, and would probably never have been dealt with at all, but for a revolt of the girls against the succession of books on sport, in which the illustrator seemed to have forgotten that there were such things as women in the world. Selina accordingly made for it one rainy morning, and announced that she was the lady seated in the centre, whose gown of rich, flowered brocade fell in such straight, severe lines to her feet whose cloak of dark blue was held by a jewelled clasp, and whose long, fair hair was crowned with a diadem of gold and pearl. Well, we had no objection to that. It seemed fair enough, especially to Edward, who promptly, promptly proceeded to grab the armour man, who stood leaning on his shield at the lady's right hand. A dainty and delicate armour man this, and I confess, though I knew it was all right and fair and orderly, I felt a slight pang when he passed out of my reach into Edward's possession. His armour was just the sort I wanted myself, scalloped and fluted and shimmering and spotless. And though he was but a boy by his beardless face and golden hair, the shattered spear shaft in his grasp proclaimed him a genuine fighter and fresh from some such agreeable work. Yes, I grudged Edward the armour man, and when he, had, when he said I could have the fellow on the other side, and I hung back and said I'd think about it. This fellow had no armour nor weapons, but wore a plain jerkin with a leather pouch, a mere civilian, and with one hand he pointed to a wound in his thigh. I didn't care about him, and when Harold eagerly put in his claim, I gave way and let him have the man. The cause of Harold's anxiety only came out later. It was the wound he coveted, it seemed. He wanted to have a big sore wound of his very own, and go about and show it to people, and excite their envy or win their respect. Charlotte was only too pleased to take the child angel seated at the lady's feet, grappling with a musical instrument much too big for her. Charlotte wanted wings badly, and next to those a guitar or a banjo. The angel besides wore an amber necklace, which took, took her fancy immensely. This left the picture allotted, with the ex exception of two or three more angels, who peeped or perched behind the main figures with a certain subdued drollery in their faces, as if the thing had gone on long enough, and it was now time to upset something or kick up a row of, of some sort. We knew these good folk to be saints and angels, because we had been told they were. Otherwise, we should never have guessed it. Angels, as we knew them in our Sunday books, were vapid, colourless, uninteresting characters, with straight up and down sorts of figures, with white nightgowns, white wings and the same straight yellow hair parted in the middle. They, they were serious, even melancholy, and we had no desire to have any traffic with them. These bright, bejeweled little persons, however, piquant, piquant of face and radiant of feather, were evidently hatched from quite a different egg, and we felt we might have interests in common with them. Short-nosed, shock-headed, with mouths that went up at the corners, and with an evident disregard for all their fine clothes, they would be the best of good company, we felt sure, if only we could manage to get at them. One doubt alone disturbed my mind. In games requiring agility, those wings of theirs would give them a tremendous pull. Could they be trusted to play fair? I asked Selina, who replied scornfully, that angels always played fair. But I went back and had another look at the brown-faced one, peeping over the back of the lady's chair, and still I had my doubts. When Edward went off to school, a great deal of adjustment and reallotment took place and all the heroes of illustrated literature were at my call, did I choose to possess them. In this particular case, however, I made no haste to seize upon the armour man. 
Perhaps it was because I wanted a fresh saint of my own, not a saint, stale saint that Edward had been for so long a time. Perhaps it was rather that, ever since I had elected to be saintless, I had got into the habit of strolling off into the background and amusing myself with what I found there. A very fascinating background it was, and held a great deal, though so tiny. Meadowland came first, set with flowers, blue and red, like gems. Then a white road ran with willful, uncalled-for loops, up a steep conical hill, crowned with towers, bastioned walls and belfries. And down the road the little knights came riding, two and two. The hill on one side descended to water, tranquil, far-reaching and blue. And a very curly ship lay at an anchor, with one mast having an odd sort of crow's nest at the top of it. There was plenty to do in this pleasant land. The annoying thing about it was, one could never penetrate beyond a certain point. I might wander up that road as often as I liked, but I was bound... Er, uh, sorry. I was bound to be brought up at the gateway, the funny gallery to top-heavy gateway of the little walled town. Inside, doubtless, there were hijinks going on, but the password was denied to me. I could get on board a boat and row up as far as the curly ship, but around the headland I might not go. On the other side of a surety, the shipping lay thick. The merchants walked on the quay, and the sailors sang as they swung out the corded bales. But as for me, I must stay down in the meadow and imagine it all as best I could. Once I broached the subject to Char Charlotte and found, to my surprise, that she had had the same joys and encountered the same disappointments in this delectable country. She, too, had walked up that road and flattened her nose against the portcullis, and she pointed out something that I had overlooked. To wit, that if you rode off in a boat to the curly ship, and got hold of a rope, and clambered aboard her, and swarmed up the mast, and got into the crow's nest, you could see just you could just see over the headland, and take in at your ease the life and bustle of the port. She proceeded to describe all the fun that was going on there, at such length and with so much particularity, that I looked at her suspiciously. Why, you talk as if you'd been in that crow's nest yourself, I said. Charlotte answered nothing but pursed her mouth up and nodded violently for some minutes, and I could get nothing more out of her. I felt rather hurt. Evidently she had managed, somehow or other, to get up into that crow's nest. Charlotte had got ahead of me on this occasion. It was necessary, no doubt, that grown-up people should dress themselves up and go forth to pay calls. I don't mean that we saw any sense in the practice. It would have been so much more reasonable to stay at home in your old clothes and play. But we recognised that these folk had to do many unaccountable things, and after all it was their life, and not ours, and we were not in a position to criticise. Besides, they had many habits more objectionable than this one, which was generally meant to free an untrammeled afternoon, wherein to play the devil in our own way. The case was different, however, when the press gang was abroad, when prayers and excuses were alike disregarded, and we were forced into the service, like native levies impelled towards the foe less by the inherent righteousness of the cause than by the indisputable rifles of their white allies. This was unpardonable, and altogether detestable. Still, the thing happened, now and again and when it did there was no arguing about it. The order was for the front, and we just had to shut up and march. Oh, and with that we come to the end of the reading part. Oh, I must admit I did not sleep particularly well last night, so I'm still not quite awake, even though it is about quarter past two now. Oh, excuse me. Well, clearly you can tell that I'm not quite awake, as I'm still yawning. But, never mind. That is how things go. So, regardless of that, I am going to say thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night, 
no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. Excuse me. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.